technical glitch right at the beginning. The Ocelli effect is live. That's why you hear stuff like that. Okay. It is. March the 26th, 2015. Okay. So, you know, look, the new intro, I'm happy with it. I wanted to make sure that Jefferson Morley wasn't a liar when he said I had a spooky kind of intro, so there you go. Anyway. Tonight, we're doing something that I've been wanting to do for a very long time. (laughs) Okay. We all know, if you've listened to my show, that JFK is one of those areas of interest for me. The assassination, the intrigue that surrounded the situation, exactly what caused it, exactly what happened to our country as a result of November 22nd, 1963. Of course, that has to do with the adventures of going into the Vietnam War, etc., etc., and all of the other divinations that did occur afterwards. And we can argue about that, and we can discuss it, and we can say that maybe... Kennedy was the last actual president we had. We could say all those kinds of things. But here's what the problem is. Not only does the mainstream media and the apologists for the Warren Commission like to perpetrate their fictions upon us, but there are those who are more conspiracy-minded who seem to be perpetrating all sorts of wonderful fairy tales on us. Now, this isn't an attack on any particular person or any particular set of people. This is an attack on the nonsense, the absolute garbage, which has been absolutely counterproductive to the work that, you know, a fool like myself spends half of his lifetime sinking money, effort, time, energy, heartache, aggravation, and hell, that was just reading Bugliosi's book. (laughs) And that laugh right there comes from a return guest, Carmine Sabastano. Greetings. How are you? Ah, I'm doing okay. Buongiorno. (laughs) Buongiorno, signore. (laughs) Ah, see, it's not all about the vowels, though, don't worry, because we also have a couple other people on with us tonight, and I'm really happy this is the first time they've been on, and uh, that's Trish Fleming. And Zach, you know what's funny about Zach is I actually don't know how to pronounce his last name. I've only ever read it. I've never said it, and I realized that when I was going to air. <laughs> so I'd like it if you guys introduced yourselves. Go ahead and unmute. Hey, how you doing? Oh, there's Trish. Trish Fleming. And... Yes. Where's Zach? Hi, it's Zach. It's Gendro. Gendro. Thank you. 
See, I wasn't. Yeah, just just as it looks. Well, you know, it's a surprise because sometimes you look at somebody's name and it's not, you know, the J is silent, the E is actually an A. You, you don't know, you know. Hey, not a problem. Not a problem there. Nice to hear from you, Chuck. Good to be here. Absolutely. See, this this goes to show you that I don't script a damn thing on this show. <laughs> I never do that because... It's good to keep it fresh. Listen, I believe in the organic conversation. And I know it sounds like I'm in a jovial mood, but really, I am irritated beyond belief and have been dying to do this show. Okay? Well, we're happy to be part of it, Chuck. Oh, man. And I'm so glad that I have allies here to do this with. Because otherwise, you know, it's just Chuck screaming about, you know, certain people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and and the nonsense that they push, and and it's just well, you know, they disagree with Chuck, so therefore, no, 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 they yeah, disagree with, with reality. Chuck. Yeah. So, uh, anyway, Carmine, I'd like you to go ahead and and speak your mind about why it is we're doing this and everything. I know we're starting off a little slow, but I wanted to lay the groundwork so we make sense of this. No, that sounds great. I actually would like to start uh, with a definition of myth for everyone. Perfect. A myth is a traditional or legendary story concerning an event with or without determinal basis of fact or natural explanation. Can't say it any better than that, and this is the area we're going to cover. <laughs> and they can, people are free to disagree. We don't, we're not saying these are definitive. We are saying we've looked at a lot of evidence, and none of these things stand up. So we believe that they are a waste of our time and our community's time. Now, people can pursue them as much as they like, but until they get some evidence, they don't mean anything. Exactly. And uh, I don't know, Zach or Trish, either one of you, if you want to add to what it is that is like the motive behind why you wanted to be involved in this show, speak for yourselves. I'd like, I'd like to divide in the research community to stop. I mean, you know, there's there's so much left and right going on that at the end of the day, we're all just spinning our tires. Uh, at, no one's going to solve this by themselves. We need to work together. There has to be some sort of mutual understanding and mutual respect amongst the researchers. And it can't be lone nutter against conspiracy theorists anymore. It's more about solid research versus myth makers. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think that, you know, go ahead, Carmine. Oh, I'm sorry, Zach. No, 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 I talk enough. You, you. I'll go after. <laughs> oh, I think that it's important. I have a historian background, and I think it's important. One of the main things I learned is that when you're first starting research and as you continue down that path is that you have to eliminate things that are, you know, stumbling blocks, things that don't add up, because all it's doing is, is, is preventing you from getting to the truth. And, and that goes with any topic. But something that involves so much mystery and intrigue, you have to be especially careful and, and, and try to, you know, I don't want to use the word garbage, but you have to toss out what isn't as useful as the other bits. You have to, or you're going to be sitting there forever spinning your wheels. See, there you go. And, and I'll tell you something. I'm going to dedicate my portion of this little show to a... a, a very seldom heard name in the research community, which is Dr. Roger Remington, okay? Because this is the guy who I have had many conversations with over the years who has kept me in check regarding a lot of this, about trying to rely on tangible things as opposed to the theoretical, as opposed to the fanciful. He's basically a Warren Commission deconstructionist for the most part, okay? But he's also a historian you know, retired professor from Aquinas College. I don't know if you guys have ever even heard of him. Uh, what, four books out on the assassination? Uh, the best the best known one is probably Biting the Elephant. Okay. Well, that's why I like your show, Chuck. It'll help me find some new stuff. I'll look him up. You, you definitely look him up. Self-published and actually is working on his final book on the case. So... Uh, a new a new volume will come out from him shortly, and believe it, when this guy says something, he backs it up not only with documentation, but with actual, you know, attempting to and speaking to and going to the sources as best he can and things like that, you know, actual research. A man after my own heart. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And, I mean, and the guy doesn't make a statement without, you know, having not one reference for it, but probably four for each statement. 
Fancy that, facts. Who knew? <laughs> facts that are verified and re-verified. Ah, oh, strange world, isn't it? I know. It's, uh, I don't understand why we even have to discuss this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but unfortunately, it is because, especially in the electronic age, and, and see, this went on before the Internet, okay? I, I know you guys might not realize this, but this kind of stuff was going on long before the Internet. And um, I don't know where you want to start exactly. I know that Carmine and I kind of came up with a bullet point list of, of places to start with. The, the uh, worst. The, like, we, we picked the worst stuff we could think of. Okay, and uh, but here's the thing. Just I have had a no discussion with Zach, and I've had no discussion with Trish. I'd like you guys to pick something. I guarantee you, it's on this list. Well, let's see. I mean, you could start with something. In my mind, I mean, the things like um, Badge Man, and uh, you know, uh, the Umbrella Man, and what he meant to at the scene, and, and things like that. I mean. Where, where do you go with that? In, in, in the long term of it, there's no fact to really support any of that, and people kind of like to build their stories around this. All of a sudden, Badge Man went from a shadow to becoming the assassin. And I mean, where, that would seem to be somewhat mythological, I would think, you know, based upon the fact there's no evidence of anything to back that up. Please, take the pictures out first. I argue about those so much. Okay, let's begin there. Um... The first statement I want to make is that, primarily, the original mistakes made on this stuff were made in a time when the technology was not there to verify a lot of things. You would end up with blurs. You'd end up with reprints of things that created greater shadows. You know, you'd end up with all sorts of interesting anomalies in photographs, okay? And some people seized upon them because they were looking, they were digging, they were going through piles of, you know, needles looking for the needle. <laughs> All right? And I understand that. Right. But as we evolved, okay, as we went from the 60s to the 70s and so on and so forth, I, I, I lost my taste for this kind of stuff. Because what happened is, every time, you know, you went and did a scientific analysis to see if it was even physically feasibly possible for half of these things to exist doesn't work. Yep. They're guessing. They're doing their best guess off of, most of the time, a copy, or at best, something they took from a site that never had an original in the first place. That's like when you said, you have the Fox originals. Those are solid. Those are from a source that can be authenticated. They mean something. They're evidence. But when I hear people say, well, I have this picture, and it proves 15 shots, I just want to kill myself. It's like, no, it doesn't. It doesn't prove any of that. You're just going on about nothing and wasting everyone's time. See, I had that terrible experience on a show, which I'm not going to name here, but um, on a show with somebody who was discussing Doorway Man with me. Oh. Uh, for, the oh. list, for the listeners who don't know, <laughs> there was a, uh, a Associated Press photographer there, okay, whose name is Altkins. Therefore, uh -huh. his photographs have been named thereafter, the Altkins photographs. In Altkins 6, if memory serves me correctly, there is a portion of the photograph uh, which is positioned just above the limousine on the print uh, where the doorway of the school book depository can be seen. For many years, people argued that Oswald was in the doorway at the time of the shooting because the limousine is in such a position that there is no way if Oswald was in that doorway which seems logical. If Oswald was in the doorway, he could not have fired the shots from the sixth floor. That's fine and dandy. The problem is... The evidence. The evidence doesn't work. None of it. None of it. I mean, absolutely none of it. Now, I was on a show, and somebody was presenting me with an Internet photograph taken from the John McAdams website. Okay. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. You know, okay. There are, let me say this, for, for our friends on hopefully what will not long be the other side and those who use evidence will join us. I think everybody has something to contribute, but people need to be more honest about the politics. There's a lot of politics in this that have absolutely nothing to do with the case, mm -hmm. and Professor McAdams is one of the people who spins those politics. Now, I respect some of his work, but I do not respect the way that he plays around with people. 
No, absolutely, and I, I, I would say the same thing. And as a matter of fact, he's probably one of the least nasty guys that I've had to deal with from that side. Now, that's a strange statement, right? <laughs> well, they haven't met everyone you have. <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but he's probably one of the least nasty guys from that side. Um, okay, again, I don't want to be personal discussions, but meanwhile, this is a reproduction of a reproduction of a reproduction on McAdams' website. Okay, fine. I yank out of a folder while I'm sitting there talking to this individual on his radio show uh, my copy of the one that I got from the Chicago Tribune uh, archives. Okay? <laughs> so like, secondary source beats tertiary source. That's what I thought. And I examine it under magnification and can't find the same anomalies that he sees. And then he corrects me about, you know, I use the word distortion because he says, well, notice this here, this person's face is coming out of a wall. And I looked at it and I said, well, that's a distortion in the photograph. And then I was corrected by being told that distortions are only characterized as things like barrel distortion, pin cushion distortion, and I'm like, no, if you understand optics at all, there is all sorts of distortions that can occur in the image. Mm -hmm. okay? uh, pin cushion and barrel distortion are two types of distortion. They are not exclusively the only types of distortion that can occur in a photograph. It's the wrong person to argue with, did he? Uh, well, you know, I thought so, but... Again, you know, I'm one of these guys who obviously just has this crazy agenda about looking at something as close to the primary source as possible, you know. I know. We're madmen. Madmen. Evidence. Who could think? Well, anyway, the photographic evidence. Well, you know, it's... Yeah. Good. Go ahead, Zach. Oh, oh sorry. This is Zach. Um, I, it's it's uh, really vital to understand. I, with my background, I worked with a lot of uh, archives, and I... I Try to focus mostly on photographs, and it's really important that you have as close to the original source material as possible. And if possible, you could, you know, do a high-resolution scan off of the original negative. And what, you know, what people don't quite understand sometimes, and you know, is that the more, like you're saying, the further you get from the original, the more uh, diluted the quality gets, and you don't know what you're looking at anymore. Now, speaking of photographic evidence where you don't know what you're looking at, um, just really quickly, there's been a lot of mistakes and a lot of shadows that people have turned into people in a lot of different photographs, and I mean in depository windows, on the grassy knoll, everywhere. There's a huge amount of them. But let's talk about one of the most famous misdirections in photographic evidence where you have a delusion of the image, okay? And that would be, hey, the limo driver shot him. Yep. Uh, okay. Anybody, I, I'll, I'll throw it Cooper. out there. Any one of you, go right ahead. Cooper. This is the, the Bill Cooper synopsis uh, where he, or, or synopsis, excuse me, the Bill Cooper hypothesis. Yes. <laughs> okay. I was being nice. But this is the Bill Cooper hypothesis where he says that he knows for sure that the limo driver shot him in the face. And then goes on to tell us that it was with a certain kind of gun and that it was poison and all this other stuff. Okay. The problem here is that not only does he say that, but he says it's backed up by documents that he saw while he was working with the Pacific Fleet somewhere, which has nothing to do with the Secret Service in the 1970s, so it was verified by that. Wrong. <laughs> yep. There's no reason for that documentation to have passed over his desk, even if he was in such a position to see such classified documents, okay? So that's the end of that story. But the real problem here is that there was a misrepresented Zapruder film, which, anybody want to talk about the condition of that film? I think that Zach's the expert. I'm willing to weigh in once they do. <laughs> <laughs> well, what, what version are we talking about? What, what would generally be called the Cooper version of the Zapruder film. Oh, yes. You know, I've tried to uh, track that down. I, I have some friends that have, uh, you know, a lot of faith in Bill Cooper. But he's got quite a reputation among conspiratorial-minded people. And, and uh, it, does it, it appears in this film, isn't it, something like there rides a dark horse or something like that? Well, actually, I'll, I'll tell you what the history is without a problem. <laughs> because sad to say... Uh, uh, somewhere around 1990, and I do believe it might have been more like 1989, when I first got involved in the case, I used to do something called videotape trading, where I would trade videotapes of all sorts of rare things with other people through the mail. 
I know it sounds like a really crazy, arcane idea, but believe me, it used to happen. Um, That's and like it, work we thankfully do not have to do anymore. Right. Um, but the thing is that uh, I actually received one of the Bill Cooper productions during that time, which means that I got probably the second or third version that he put out um, from him. <laughs> okay. Wow. So what that was called was uh, Assassin Unmasked originally. That was the graphic that he put on it with, uh, with I, I figured it out later, it was a Gold Star VCR that you could actually insert graphics into videotapes with if you used it properly. Okay. Anyway, um, this is what he used, and he had a very, very, like, I don't know how many generations removed from a broadcast of the Zabruder film that he utilized in his presentation. So what happens to a videotape when you keep recording it onto another videotape? A copy of a copy of a copy. Grades. And the image begins to blur. The colors begin to melt into one another. A lot of odd things happen. And this film, again, is not exactly the highest quality to begin with. Yeah. Okay. But the problem is, of course, technology being what it was in the late 80s, this is what he presented as. And if you look at this thing, and at, you know, at a glance, at an uneducated glance, you could almost believe that there is a gun in the film. Okay? problem is, if you look at a clear version of the film, you know there's no gun. You know exactly what that shiny thing is. Uh, you know why it seems as though, you know, the hand goes one way when it doesn't actually go anywhere and everything else. If you look at a clear copy of it, if you look at even a remotely clear copy of the Zapruder film, you won't see this. It's not there. Yeah. And I think that's the unfortunate case with a lot of these things, is that people want to believe there's something there, but without evidence of it, it doesn't matter. We're just arguing endlessly about things we cannot prove, so why are we arguing about them? No, I, I hear you. And I want to hear from Trish on some of this stuff, too, so please get involved, Trish. <laughs> Cause I'm, I'm, well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Because um, I'll talk way too much. I was going to say this is a proof, yeah. <laughs> Hey, throw yourself under the bus, buddy. Sorry, Trish. I think that it's important. It's okay. I, I think it's important to follow the history of whose hands actually touched everything. For example, uh, and this is just my opinion, but Robert Grodin was the first one who brought it out, obviously, in Good Night America. And I don't know if people are familiar with his technique called Grodin scoping, but it seems that every film that came out at some point went through his hands, one another. And I think it's important because, again, your information is only as credible as your source. And if the source is in question, then you have to question everything. So, again, I think with all the photos, whether it be the Marianne Mormon photo, uh, the Zapruder film, the Nix film, etc., I think it's extremely important to follow where the original film went and the history and who made copies and what generation. That goes ampled with uh, Dictabelt, for example. I mean... Gary Mack brought it out during the HSCA committee, and, you know, later on, Steve Barber later disputed it with acoustics findings. And I think that it's very important to follow the history of the physical film itself. Yeah, and, and Trish raises a good point about the, the Grodin scoping, which is basically like an animation technique. And when they aired it on Goodnight America, he basically interspersed it with different clips, and he wasn't explaining where it came from and what he did, and people were trying to... No, oh, is this really what we're seeing here? And then, you know, in reality, no, that wasn't it. It was, he, you know, it was altered. And they, I, not to, you know, point blame, but that happened. I mean, even to the point right. where he had taken uh, um, quite a few films and basically spliced them together. So you have a moment by moment from the time he turns off Main Street onto Houston Street, there's different films that he has spliced, which to a certain degree, again, is modifying it to make it as a one solid running film. And again, you have to take that into account. He may not have manipulated it in the sense where he's actually changed things on the film, but at the end of the day, you're not viewing the original film. And I think that that's really important, that the actual physical film needs to be followed, not only with just the pictures, but who had their hands on it. I mean, you know, the more you dig into how many copies were made, who got copies of any of the films, it's really quite astonishing to realize that, you know, it could have been tampered with with multiple different sources. And just the fact that the Zabruder film has been spliced is evidence 
that, that it was modified some way. And again, I'm not saying that anything in regards to the actual head shot and making his head go backwards versus forward, etc. I'm saying that at the end of the day, basically because there is splices on it, somewhere along the line, it was tampered with. Right, and that, you know, that could be one of the bigger myths itself is that, you know, people believing that the Zapruder film is a legit, you know, historical record of what took place. And like Trish said, the fact that even if one or two frames were removed, someone had a motive to do so, and it is, it's not accurate anymore. I, I totally agree. I think that this also goes into other evidence as well with the chain of custody, how Trish said you have to keep track. If the chain of custody is broken, the evidence is no good. You have to then verify it with other evidence and right. see if it's right. still verifiable. No, absolutely. Right. And, That's exactly it. And, and the, the whole thing about uh, exactly what Groden did, we discussed that uh, with, with Gail Nix Jackson on this show, actually, because uh, she said for the first time anybody realized <laughs> that, you know, part of what Groden was presenting that night on Goodnight America was actually uh, part of her grandfather's film. Uh, she said, I didn't think anybody else saw right. that. <laughs> I knew it right away. That's exactly right. it. And, and he, he didn't even make that clear as he was presenting it. That's right. No, and, that, was yeah. and again, just the, how he got access to all these films is also very unruly. I mean, <laughs> there's no clear-cut indication of how Grodin got these films. Well, yeah, that, that's well. The, the Zapruder film itself, there's kind of a, a decent trail of, of of how you can figure out how he got his hands on that mechanics copy, and all of that. Um, that's reasonable, but. When you get into the rest of the nexus of Groden's collection, eh, it's another story. Well, exactly. Right. Okay. My, my, well, I think that you, since you guys brought up Groden, so they can't blame me, <laughs> one of my problems with him, he seems like a lovely fellow. When I met him at Dealey Plaza, he seemed pleasant. But he was one of the attendees at what I like to call the Judith Berry Baker grave party, where they all went to Oswald's grave and basically threw a party and took pictures. I have a problem with that. I don't care about anyone in this case personally. I don't know them. I wasn't alive when they were. But have a little respect. Don't go to someone's grave and take pictures and make an event out of it. How about take your story, your myth, as I like to call it, and present it somewhere else where a dead body isn't buried? Hmm. I don't know who could argue with that. You know, I, I, I didn't understand that when I heard about it. I have not understood a lot of the exploitation of a lot of people that have uh, since passed on and have had their words twisted around. Yeah. But, uh, wow. That's, I think, part of our deal. I think, you know, people are like, what drives you, Carmine? Well, one of the things is all the dead people that so many people keep impugning, that the dead people deserve some respect from both sides. I didn't agree with Jim Garrison, but he doesn't deserve to be treated like scum. And I'm tired of people doing it. I'm tired of people treating people on the other side like scum, too. We're either going to solve this together or we're going to argue forever about nothing. And, and I, I take this time to say to everybody who is interested in the truth about 9-11, you need to take a lesson from this. Because although the technology has improved, believe me, the same thing can happen there. You know, if you legitimately believe that a, a new investigation is required, take the lessons from the JFK research community and understand you can be held off for half a century and on into perpetuity, okay, by stuff like this. Well, and another, well another thing that, you know, you're hitting on, and this goes right in with 9-11, too, is that there, these are people, and Carmen hinted at this, is that these are people's memories. This isn't just some fantasy story that's a detective story that we can sit and you know, nitpick about for our own entertainment. There's people's feelings, memories, family yeah. members involved in this, and it needs to be treated with respect. You're right. I totally agree with all of you, and I hope that it starts to carry across the community because I'm tired of people. You know what? I love to joke, as I'm sure some of the people who debate me know. But I'll joke about subjects. I don't joke about people. I don't go after people directly, though they do love to come for me. <laughs> mm. Well, and you know what? While, while we're well, at another, it, Go ahead. Go ahead, Zach. No, go ahead. Sorry about that. Oh, it's okay. I, oh, would, I was just going to say, beyond the, 
Yeah, go ahead. Beyond the memories of the beyond the memories of the deceased, we have to take into account the the the, the legacy of the people that are still with us and how they were affected. I mean, one of the things that upset Trish and I a lot was the way that sometimes Marina Oswald is being portrayed and, and the way that the memories of her and Lee Oswald are, are being scattered about. I mean, you, you see, you know, 50-year-old rumors of their love life being bandied about like it's just some sort of barbershop gossip. And, I, I mean, I find that offensive. I mean, the, the Marina is, is still with us, and obviously, and her children and they that's her, that's right that's their family and their father and i mean goodness it's just it seems to you know get quite ugly at times i just think a lot of this a lot of people don't understand that you know 50 years have passed and people that are completely innocent for example marina's children marina and lee's children this impacts them daily i mean you know and to have not only their father smeared, but their mother being smeared has to be difficult. And at the end of the day, we need to respect the fact that, you know, whether Lee was innocent or guilty, his children are innocent bystanders in this, his grandchildren. And I think that it comes down to just respecting the children. I mean, again, they weren't around when a lot of this was happening. And if they were, they don't remember it. And I think it's very important. And I think that people lose sight of that, like Zach was saying. These are real people, a real situation. It's not just some sort of movie that we're following. And, you know, it needs to be recognized as traumatic event for a lot of people, whether they were witnesses to the actual assassination or, you know, indirectly involved with it. People need to respect that the that there are people that are still attached to the memory of these people that are being trashed. And it, it's, that was personally what alarms me is how petty and how insignificant that these conversations have become knocking everybody. And I'm not saying that I agree with everything Marina says and she's a saint by any means. What I'm saying is at the end of the day, whether you respect what she had to say in her testimony or not, at the end of the day, her children deserve that respect. Yeah, and it's one thing, I think, to discuss it in Facebook or in forums, but I don't have a problem with people criticizing, but criticize with some evidence. Don't just criticize to criticize, otherwise you're wasting yes. everyone's time. It, well, exactly, and, and Marina is one of those people, though, that, that I view, regardless of what everybody else thinks of her, I, I view her as an absolute victim because, uh, you know, look, look at what she was faced with. You know, immediately the government turned on her. The whole country was going to turn on her. You know, she's the wife of the assassin. She's the commie wife of the assassin, first of all. Uh, then ever after, she's being chased down by people that are trying to, uh, you know, elicit all sorts of details from her that uh, were really inappropriate. And most of the time she had no knowledge of. Uh, you know, she's continuously called on the carpet for things, and even though she's remarried, she's forever Marina Oswald, uh, you know, and pretty much, I mean, her children don't even have a, a public life, for the most part, uh, based on this, this whole That's thing. That's exactly it. Yeah. I, I think this might lead us perfectly into That's someone right. else you and I wanted to put on the list, Chuck. Well, go right ahead, Carmine, because well, I don't know where you're going. If I may start, then. Judith Very. Baker. She, to me, represents one of the largest feasible myth makers in our community. Someone who has wasted 15 years of everyone's time. Go ahead, Zach and Trish, because... <laughs> Go ahead. Well, you know, I, I really don't want to make this a personal attack on Judith, but in my opinion, I think that if you're going to explain a story such as she has, again, not only is evidence required, but on the same token, of course people are going to pick it apart. I mean, people are going to analyze what she says. They're going to look for new clues based off her statements. And I really do feel that sometimes the attitude from her and the people that believe her and are basing their belief solely on faith that she's telling the truth, really do end up making more of a divide in the community than really what's necessary. I mean, you know, it, it's really a line drawn in the sand that either you're with us or against us. If, you know, for myself, I've said this many times, you can believe in a conspiracy and Lee's innocent without believing her story. And that's personally how I feel. I don't believe Judy Baker at all. I really don't. 
I really find that her story is very well fabricated and woven in to historic facts. But at the end of the day, she doesn't have anything to back it up other than some WTs and she worked with Oswald. Um, I think that people need to really analyze everything. And that's not just with her story. That's with a lot of researchers, oh. yeah. you know. Um, we're still discussing the same stuff that was brought up 25 years ago. You know, there's got to be more information out there. And I think that people need to really kind of dig in their heels and start analyzing everything from square one. And I'm, I'm even talking about the Warren Commission, the HSCA, and everything else that has been officially documented. People need to go through every statement with a fine tooth comb, and they have to be unbiased about it. If you go in with the attitude that leaves innocent, of course you're not going to notice anything else. Same versus if you go in it wholeheartedly that leaves guilty. You have to go into each piece of evidence and statements and look at it with unbiased eyes, and you have to follow both sides as far as they take you. Yeah, and you have to go to the primary evidence. Don't go to books. Books are great exactly. if you want to check out people's opinions on the evidence, but books are not definitive. Books are secondary sources. Right, and, I, and I've said several times that what I usually do with a book is I read through it once to see, you know, if it e even seems remotely possible that anything is valuable in it. I go through it a second time and begin to break down exactly their citations, where they come from. Uh, you know, this is why I'm not a fan of Lamar Waldron. Um, but anyway. <clears throat> yeah, I don't mean to, sorry, I deviated from the topic. Well, yeah. let, me, let me just do a quick uh, greatest hits. The reasons why I do not believe Judith Baker. She has okay. no primary evidence. Her name never appears in any single file she has ever been able to present since the first time I asked her months ago till now. She claimed that she made anthrax on the education forum. Anyone can go there and check it. And I suggest that you read my article, Trish's article, uh, Matthew Schofield's article. There's quite a few articles about her and why her story shall never work. Now, the anthrax thing. She needed training that she didn't have time for. Once again, timeline problems like the commission because she said she was 19 and she was doing these things. It takes years. She was a lab assistant at best. She never made a cancer bioweapon because there's no evidence of it. There's no evidence that that technology even existed at the time. So when I hear her repeat it over and over, you can repeat something so much as you like, just like the commission did. It doesn't make it true. Well, that, that is part of the problem. But every time you begin to break down even the smallest thing in one of her, you know, in, in one of her stories, it seems to me, it falls apart based on the context. A yeah. uh, really great thing that, uh, that Zach and Trish did recently, I wonder if you guys would, like, kind of give people the idea of that article you guys just put out. Reverend Jim. Reverend Jim, yes, because I pointed to Absolutely. the very same. I pointed to the very same situation in an article years ago. Okay, uh, but but my whole thing was the the ridiculousness of misprinting the word new. I'm sorry, that's not something that a dyslexic would do who hails from New Orleans. Okay, find me anybody who is knowledgeable on the uh, on, on the subject of dyslexia and tell me that they're going to get a subject who does that as a grown male. Go ahead and find one, okay? But, okay, we'll leave that alone. You guys came up with something, though, that I thought was just, wow. <laughs> so please, tell everybody. Well, when we started into this, again, we were more interested in, we started looking up uh, uh, Lillian Moret's testimony. And what jumped out at us was this lettering job that Lee had basically not received. He had been practicing his lettering, and Mrs. Moret had stated that her six-year-old daughter, neighbor's daughter could do a better job at lettering. So we started looking into that a little bit, and then we ended up looking into the Warren Commission and finding that two individuals were interviewed at a place called the Ad Shop, and that was located on South Rampart. When we started doing a little bit more digging and pulling up newspapers, we actually found the ad for the lettering job that Lee had applied for. And it was for a large advertising company, which was very interesting. So just on a fluke, we were reading through Judy Berry Baker's book, and she had mentioned it 18 times that they had been doing some lettering and some painting at this shop. So we started looking into the shop a little bit more in the area and the history of the area, and 
basically it just came back that it wasn't possible. It, it just wasn't possible. Um, the, the segregation and the tension in that time, especially with the Freedom Riders that were doing their bus tour from Washington to New Orleans, um, that was a good indication of the tension that was building up in that time period. And when we started looking into um, Reverend James, who she refers to as Reverend Jim, and again, James is his last name, so I don't know why she would shorten his last name as Jim, but mm. aside from that, we discovered that he was, in fact, a black man. So we started researching white people working for blacks back then. And that came directly into the Jim Crow laws of that time and the segregation and how, you know, for example, a black child could not play in a baseball diamond within two block radius of the white community. So that started setting off bells. So again, we did as much research as we could trying to find pictures of this location. Unfortunately, we were never able to find an actual picture of this shop. But we were able to find some history dating back to the 1900s in the Jewish community and a lot of stores that were run there. And then once we started realizing how rough of a neighborhood this was and how how to put this politely, how two white individuals would stick out like a sore thumb in this neighborhood. And again, they would literally be breaking the law by working for a black man. And again, they needed separate bathrooms. They needed separate eating areas for the white employees if this was possible. And to be honest, we couldn't find one example of white people working for the coloreds back then. There was a lot of information about how Employers would have to sign off and take responsibility for black employees and that sort of thing. But we couldn't find one example of Caucasian people working for colors during that time period. Right, and, and, and Judith neglected to mention in her book, she, she, and you know, to her credit, seemed to be, um, you know, forward-minded about civil rights, but n no, not at a single time did she mention that, uh, you know, that James was an African-American. And, and, you know, I think that would be a very uh, significant uh, thing for her to mention. And, and it, like, the way that the laws were worded is basically that they would have to provided these expensive accommodations. And, and from all uh, historic references, uh, Reverend James's place was quite a small place, and, and we can't determine how this would have ever taken place. Well, right, and and just just to clarify really quickly, uh, the fact that you guys are using the term "colored" is because that was contemporaneous with the time. Yeah, uh, it was in, it's in the documents. Yeah, I mean that's right. exactly what they said. Right, think. right. Uh, there was you know white and colored. This was the definitions of the separation. That's the, the root of what was going on. So this is why you guys exactly. are using that term. Yeah, yeah. We don't want to make that clear. We want we want to save ourselves from attacks. Yes. That's another thing I'd like to discuss, too, is that yes. all of us have received threats. All of us, and I'm talking right now, have received, you know, uh, people swearing at us. That goes to the other box for me now because I started a block list that I'm more than happy to pass out to anyone listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because that's the way I think that this is my opinion, and everyone can disagree with me all they like. But the only way it seems in some cases that we are going to raise the conversation above these people who do not wish to talk about evidence is to get rid of them, to put them in a part of Facebook where they can rant by themselves away from the rest of us who use evidence. And, and not just Facebook, Carmine. I mean, you know, there are the various forums, all right? There are the various areas where they comment, they, they go after you on, I mean, YouTube, believe me, I had a history of, of these people on YouTube that you would not believe <laughs> back yeah. when back when YouTube had a uh, you know like an email type system uh, uh, man I I could not go three hours yeah no and, and we're not I just want to state to everyone listening too we are not Judith Baker we are not saying oh we're poor victims please no we'll fight you but give, bring the evidence pal because we're not just going to sit there and argue with you about poetry. Well, yeah, there you go. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the ignorant arguments and attacking people personally and all this other stuff, you know, uh, for whatever ails them. I mean, look, I, I don't talk about uh, people that have nervous conditions, which clearly yeah. do. Uh, you know, things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. And we're not saying we do. Well, yeah, we're not saying, I'm sorry, and please, Christian Zach, chime in after. I promise I'll make this quick. Because <laughs> me and Chuck won't go forever because we like to talk to each other. But... <laughs> 
But, you know, the bottom line is, is you're here to do research, and you're here to do evidence, and you're here to progress this case, or you're in the way. Those are the only two types of people here. Right, and just really quickly, um, phone callers, please hold off until I ask for you because I've already had to dismiss a couple, and I'm sorry about that, but I'm not quite ready for you because we got a few more things on the list that I want to make sure we hit. I'm ready to move beyond Baker whenever you are. I just hope the community is ready to as well. No, that's just a taste of what's wrong. Okay, there are a myriad of, of, of circumstances, problems with the historical context of what she's saying, difficulty believing a whole lot of other things. You know, take note of interviews where she's completely upset by homosexuals, but meanwhile, uh, whether people realize it or not, there are some people who have been outed in the case, and there are still people to this day that it is not public knowledge were homosexuals that she claims to be surrounded by. Yeah. Okay, that's an oddity that I don't think anybody brings up, and, and I have a little theory about that, but it's only a theory, because Oswald seems to move in circles where there are closeted homosexuals. Yeah. Um, but anyway, well, it's, it, that one has of the to things... do with the reality of his movements, though, and I mean to tell you that that's an international thing, okay? So, yeah, go back and look at that, anybody who's researching Oswald, please, and see if you can explain it. Because I have an explanation, but I don't feel confident enough to really settle it out in public yet. Do you mind if I, uh, I uh, plug Rob Clark real quick? Oh, no, absolutely. Uh, the lone gunman. Yes, if, sir. If you get a chance, everyone, please listen to Rob Clark's, uh, I believe I was episode 51, the evidence and documents episode. We talk about another thing, Judith apparently being such a supposed close friend of David Ferry, forgot to mention, which is a document I found that shows that he was running feasibly a child sex cult called Omnipotent. Mm. So this is not the person in her latest book that she presents. No. David Ferry is not a good person. He's not jovial. He's not nice. He was a lunatic. He was a madman who had militaristic dreams and was trying to use Boy Scouts for his sexual desires. Well, and see, now, I don't know that I can even go that far because I haven't seen all this stuff, to be honest with you. Oh, no, I'll show you, I'll show you everything. And even, here's the thing. It, it's a matter of how many of these documents, because there's that one. I found one where he tried to go into a hospital to convince a young boy not to testify against him. You know, how many times does the evidence have to indicate something until this woman realizes she's wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, like I, like we've all said, though, we don't want to spend the whole time. <laughs> yeah, and you know we could. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, look, uh, if we do part two and three. Hey, we'll I do can, it again. That's, I can I'll do the documents, I promise. I, I see devoting an episode to this and, uh, and spending some special time on how it is you derive 500 pages after knowing somebody for a summer. But um, Yeah, well, well, someone said Judith is kind of like a slow train wreck, and I said, well, there's plenty of room on the train for all the myth makers. That, that's absolutely true. Let's move on to a couple of other myths, if that's okay with, uh, with you guys, Trish and Zach. Of sure, course. Go for it. And I'm sorry, it's three months of repressed anger. <laughs> no, and, and I understand. Because as I told you, I tried warning people about this uh, years ago, that yeah. this was going to become a bigger problem. And they did not take me seriously. They really did not. Because, you know, after all, I'm not the most highly educated guy who studied this. So I don't really know what I'm talking about. Nobody's ever going to take that seriously. It's just another one of those, you know, things well, that Nigel Turner did. And don't worry about it. And You know uh, what? That's, that's another myth, in my opinion. Because I'm proud to work with people who bring evidence. I don't care about titles. I don't care about their education. If they're, I'll take a reasonable man over an educated fool every day of the week. Amen to that, brother. So let's move on to a couple of other things, okay, that are constantly bandied about, especially in alternative media. And I don't know who wants to jump on this one. I'm hoping that either Trish or Zach grab this first because I know this will be fun for you, Carmine, but I'd like to hear from them. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I, I promise I won't talk again until they're done. <laughs> George H.W. Bush in Dealey Plaza. 
Well, yeah, that's that's always been an interesting one, and it, this gets back once again to uh, trying to identify people in less than pristine photographs or or images that are not quite clear, right? And there's been, you know, a picture taken of showing a guy, you know, that's not exactly a hundred percent quite certain who this gentleman is and then people say well look at this hairline look at this posture this has to be george bush i mean and that, that's quite irresponsible i mean and you know people have gone so far as to try to statistically prove that you know bush was there and he had to be and this has to be bush and i'm not naming names there's a certain gentleman who loves the statistics that i've talked to about this several times but i mean you what and but it gets back to what would it prove if he was there? I mean, it, he, he's not holding a rifle. I mean, and it, what 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 is it going to solve? Well, there, I just dropped the uh, the comparison photo because uh, I put that in the chat room for you guys listening and in the chat room, uh, so you can see from another angle the figure that is alleged to be George H. W. Bush and the same figure from another angle. Just look at it. I'd like to. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I just. No, say, I'd like to make yourself. a point. Um, go ahead. I'd like to make a point. I'd like to make a point here, and in some of the. Uh, Archival work I've done, I, part of the job that I had to do was to identify individuals in photographs. And, and sometimes you'll get photographs of people that, from families, and some family member later on down the road will write a name on the back of the picture. These are people that they knew, and they'll write a name on the back of the picture, and you can prove that it wasn't even the proper person that they're identifying, that they, that they were misidentifying somebody that they knew face-to-face -face in a photograph. So how is it that people are so certain that they know uh, who an individual is in a photograph that, A, they've never met, and, B, it's, they don't even have access to the original photograph to begin with? I mean, it's absolutely it's, it's a waste of time. Right, but, I mean, like I said, one of the really great methods is to cross-reference. If you have a multitude of photographs, you know, of a body of people from particularly different angles, which we do have a nexus of photographs here uh, in Dealey Plaza, you can compare one figure to another and sort of begin to play match game with them, and you can see them from different angles. I mean, much like that whole, you know, Jack Ruby is in front of uh, uh, the book depository thing. Uh, that was incorrect as well. You know, it's just, exactly yeah. this. Yeah. This, this, is, this should ultimately, if you're, if you're going to go that route, it should be ultimately left to a like forensic experts or be experts in anatomy, people that understand exactly what they're looking at. Lay people trying to identify people based on you know a hairline or something like that. That's it's it, you, you don't it's it's beyond the scope of what a lay person should be able to accomplish. I think a big part of it, too, is hypothetically, if George Bush was involved with this assassination in any form of way, do you really think that he would put himself in that position to be photographed? Do you really think that he would be on site? I mean, it, it, to me, that doesn't make sense. He was attempting to run a Senate campaign at the time. Would he yeah. put himself out there? Yeah, you guys are totally right. I, I waited. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so, Okay. You, guys are you guys are totally right, because that's my contention with everybody that ever says they see someone there. If you want a plot to go off, you don't show up at the crime scene. Only a moron shows up at the crime exactly. scene. Yeah, and the, uh, you know, the, uh, over the years, I, I believe I saw a graph one time compiled by somebody who, who decided to figure this out. Uh, they, they alleged something like, I don't know, 500 historical figures have been accused to have been at uh, Dealey Plaza in one way or another through somebody's work over the years. And uh, I imagine that uh, they didn't actually get to all of the literature. Okay. So, well, if I may quote the commission, which I am loath to do, but when they get it right, they get it right. Credit where credit's due. Go ahead. Uh, there is still another category of speculation and rumor that complicated and broadened the work of the commission. Numerous people claim to have seen Oswald or Ruby at various times and places in the United States or abroad. Others insisted that during those days, the following the assassination, they had detected significant actions on television that were witnessed by no one else. Well, right. I mean, uh, including people that swore up and down that they actually saw the assassination broadcast live that day. 
that was actually an assertion for many years. And there is no way that that happened. It did but not they, happen. Yeah, but they still go on. And well, hopefully this will help be the movement to start the stoppage of that. Well, again, I, I know we could treat these subjects to long discussions, but I'm trying to jump around so that we can actually get to some of these phone calls. Um, Next. <laughs> James Files, if you don't mind. Oh, Files. You guys want to go first? <laughs> the Grassy Knoll, for those who don't know, yeah, Mr. Say. Sutton. Mr. Sutton is what his is name. Jimmy. Uh, Jim Sutton, who is, uh, you know, prisoner at Joliet, I think, still, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, been interviewed a few times. Uh, has confessed to being the shooter on the Grassy Knoll. Go ahead, Trish. Well, I have a couple things I'd like to bring up about Badge Man. First and foremost, um, it has been documented that Gary Mack and Jack White weren't actually the ones that first found the Badge Man. It was actually Ruth Carter Stapleton, who was Jimmy Carter's sister. Correct. She was the first one who actually pointed out that there was an individual in the Mary Mo Marianne Mormon photo. Um, first story that went around was, of course, Roscoe White. Uh, his son came forward saying that everything was in his diary. It was all documented, so on and so forth. And then through analysis of the ink used in the diary, it was then established that his wife, Mrs. White, was actually the one who wrote up that diary. Once that story basically became dead in the water, then all of a sudden files comes into it. And for myself, I find that very intriguing, especially considering Beverly Oliver had stated that she did, in fact, see Roscoe White that day. Um, so, again, the story evolves once something is knocked down. And I think that's really important. And I think eventually, in my opinion, I think the James file will be another one of the Roscoe White stories. Well, it, it will eventually just fade out because, again, it comes down to evidence and proof. And I think that there's just too much pointing, and again, this is just my opinion, that the shot didn't come from the grassy knoll. I do believe something happened there, whether it was a diversion or something to get people to run up there. I do wholeheartedly believe that. But if you look at, uh, I believe it's called the KGB Secret Files of the Kennedy Assassination, Robert Groden and uh, amongst others, and I'm sorry, I, I can't recall who all was involved with it at this point, but they actually blocked off the plaza and did a laser test of it. And when you see how Robert Groden tries to match up the headshot with the grassy knoll, it's impossible. The bullet could not have done a U-turn in JFK's head. And by all accounts, it appears that the shot either came from the front or from the back. And again, when you take into account Custer's testimony, and again, Custer's obviously one of those people that either you believe him or you don't, it seems to make a lot more sense given the information that he stated in his testimony. So, again, I do believe wholeheartedly something happened on the grass, you know, that got people's attention and got them running that way. And, again, in my opinion, I believe it was a diversion. But if you actually look at how the bullet entered the head from the right side and then exited the right side as well, I mean, that that's, you know, physically impossible. Right. And for trajectory information, I would say, you know, uh, take a look at somebody like Sherry Feaster, who's also yep. been a guest on this show. Exactly. She's okay. great. Exactly. An actual crime scene investigator 